So why is female meiosis so error prone? And this has been a long standing question in, in my lab. Um, so the fertilized egg contains two pronuclei, each of which contains a single copy genome from, 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 from the male and female gametes. And we know that if an embryo contains an error of meiotic origin, that 95% of those will come from the egg. Um, <clears throat> and the incidence increases dramatically as, as women get older. And so what is the biological basis for this? And this has been a long, a long standing question as, as was raised in, in Agatha's talk. So the reproductive consequences of female aging are pretty dire. In order for this, this um, fertilized egg to develop to a uh, viable, viable pregnancy, it's got to have a diploid complement of chromosomes. Um, and it got, it's got to get to the blastocyst stage by day five to six. Now, as women get older, the incidence of clinical pregnancy declines dramatically. Um, <clears throat> my pointer. I guess I can do it here. Agatha, what do you need for a pointer? What do you have? Oh, sorry, is the pointer yeah. oh, What's the problem here? I'm looking for a pointer. <coughs> have a. Oh. This works as a pointer. Oh, sorry, yeah. I just didn't acquaint myself. Okay. So the clinical pregnancy go, goes down with, from about the mid-30s onwards. The clinical pregnancy de declines dramatically. And then that, that's accompanied by an increase in trisomy. So those pregnancies that are viable, you have an, uh, a, a, a dramatic increase in trisomy. And the miscarriage rate also increases from mid-30s. So the message is things are going terribly wrong from the mid-30s onwards. And if there was a, in case there was any doubt that this is an egg problem, um, this, this shows you the live, live birth rate per IVF cycle and the, the lines in, in, in orange are when a woman uses her own eggs. Then, and, and as we saw before, the pregnancy rate becomes diminishingly low in, from the, from the, in, the, in the early 40s onwards. But if we get eggs donated by a woman in, uh, uh, below the age of 35, this effect is completely rescued. So the problem lies in the egg and the aging of the egg. So in order to understand this a bit better, we're going to talk about how, how mammals make oocytes. And it commences very early in life. It commences during in utero, during fetal development. So about three to five weeks after fertilization, primordial germ cells migrate to the gonadal ridge where they undergo multiple rounds of mitotic cell division. And then towards the end of the first trimester, they enter meiosis. And this is marked here by meiotic, recomb meiotic recombination when the parental homologues become, um, reciprocally exchange DNA and remain physically linked. So a baby girl is born with her pool of, of oocytes, and as we understand it uh, at, at the moment, this is what, this will, is what drives, her drives her reproductive capacity throughout her reproductive life. And then this, throughout life, then, this pool of primordial uh, follicles becomes depleted, and this refer, we refer to as ovarian aging. Then from, from puberty, so, so these, these primordial follicles, they're recruited for growth throughout life, and when, the, when, when, when females reach puberty, they become capable of developing to the pre ovulatory stage. And <clears throat> once, just shortly before ovulation, they go from this, so, so all of this stage is called prophase, they're arrested in prophase of meiosis one. When you get these, what we call the bivalent chromosome consisting of the two homologues, is enclosed in this large nucleus we call the germinal vesicle. So just shortly before ovulation, this uh, nuclear membrane breaks down and you get the chromosomes aligning on the, the meiotic spindle. They migrate to the side to form the polar body. And, and then the remaining dyad chromosomes align on the meiosis II spindle and awaiting fertilization. And then when fertilization happens, that triggers the second meiotic division. And then only uh, after that do we get the single copy maternal genome. So the message to take here is that this process begins during fetal development 
and is not completed until decades later. So this, in the vast majority of organisms and in, in all mammals, we need to make this bivalent chromosome. We need to find a way of linking these two homologues in order for them to segregate properly during the, during the first meiotic division. So this, this meiotic recombination, which we're going to talk about a little bit more on the next slide, it creates physical linkages between maternal and paternal homologues, and that's essential for their accurate segre segregation during the first meiotic division. And it also, of course, generates direct genetic diversity and gives us, gives us each our unique um, genetic makeup. So, meiotic recombination happens during fetal development, as we said in mammals, in females rather, um, and it happens after S phase, after the chromosomes replicate. And that's so. At this pre-meiotic S phase is um, followed by a program, a, a round of programmed double strand breaks mediated by this Bo11. And there are many hundreds of these made, breaks made in the genome, and this aids the homology search. This, make, this enables the homologues to find each other. And once they do, then they form this large proteinaceous structure known as the synaptonemal complex, in which the, these double, double strand breaks are repaired, but only a fraction of them are repaired to form crossovers. And it's these crossovers, this reciprocal exchange between homologues, they're the ones that, that, that uh, uh, constitute the physical linkages which cytologically are visible as chiasma. So in a chromosome spread we call this, we call this a chiasma. So it's been known since, since the late 90s that the position and number of crossover formation is a, is, is a risk factor for, for, for tri trisomy 21. And this came from work in Stephanie Sherman's lab because they had access to a large register of Down syndrome, Down syndrome children. So the, almost counterintuitively, the average number of crossovers is greater in females than in males. However, females are a bit more careless about where they form them. They form them in vulnerable positions or else fail to form them at all. And if you don't form a crossover, then you've got these achiasmate homologues that are, that are just segregating randomly during the first meiotic division. So the biggest risk of trisomy 21 is, is failure to form a crossover. And then the second biggest risk is a single subtelomeric crossover. So if you form a crossover close to, your telom close to the telomere, you're at risk of, of trisomy, even in younger women. And then the next biggest risk is a single pericentromeric. And these are generally called susceptible chiasmate configurations. However, as the data set got bigger and they stratifi stratified it by, eight, by maternal age, they found that the correlation between these, this position and number of chiasma was lost as women got older. In other words, Down syndrome children of older women had, had similar crossover positions to the, to the non-affected children. So the conclusion from that is that the age-related meiotic errors are a consequence of, of, of events occurring subsequent to crossover formation. So all, cross, all crossover configurations become vulnerable as women get older. And if we think about it, the biggest difference between an oocyte from a younger woman and an oocyte from an older woman is that it's been arrested here in prophase for a much longer time. A 20-year-old versus 40-year-old would be 20 years longer trying to hold its genome in this really precarious um, configuration here. So how is that maintained? So we heard a lot from Agatha about the cohesion complex. So when, during the pre-meiotic S phase, we, we get loading of this um, meiosis-specific cohesion complex, which consists of this uh, cohesion ring, a heterodimer of these uh, SMC proteins, linked by this highly conserved meiotic uh, cohesion subunit called REC8. So that's loaded in the premeiotic S phase and it clamps the chromosomes together. And as we heard, this is not, this, studies in mice indicate that this is not reloaded, it's not replenished. So in answer to the question about how, how does cohesin age, I mean, if it's the same in humans, that we're relying on this cohesion complex to maintain our chromosomes, to keep our chromosomes together for decades, 
Then it acts as a timer. So that would explain how cohesin is vulnerable to aging because most, of, most proteins in our cells are turned over on, 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 a, on a fairly weak, frequent basis. So if we want to resolve this structure then to a single copy genome, it's got to align on the first meiotic spindle. You've got to have this nice compact structure where you have the, the sister kinetochores close together so that they can attach to the same spindle pole. And then this, this, this will allow um, faithful segregation. Then once they're all aligned, separase, this protease is activated, it cleaves Reg8, but Reg8, crucially, it only cleaves it on the arms. This Reg8 at the centromere must be protected. And that's the job of this Shigoshin, in mammals, Shigoshin like two. Shigoshin is a Japanese word for guardian protector. It was discovered in, uh, it was named by a Japanese scientist who published it in 2004. And Chagoshin protects Reg8 at the centromeres by recruiting a phosphatase which dephosphorylates it. And its dephosphorylated state, it cannot be recognized by separase and is therefore protected. So this maintaining the, 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 the uh, cohesion between the sister centromeres is essential for their bipolar attachment and meiosis too. So if we lose this cohesion, these guys can't align properly, and then they again will, are expected to segregate randomly during the second meiotic division. And once we get fertilization, it triggers um, um, this machinery again, which again cleaves, cleaves uh, uh, cohesion between the centromeres. So the things you've got to do in order to gen faithfully generate a single copy genome is first you've got to make this bivalent chromosome, then you've got to stabilize it, you've got to do this monopolar attachment, You've got to crucially protect centromere, uh, cohesion between centromeres, have a bipolar attachment to meiosis too, so that you can get faith, faithful separation after fertilization. And we know from innumerable studies in human oocytes that as women get older, the, 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 the type of, there, there are many types of defects, but the type of defect that correlates most strongly with age is that you get an additional single copy, that you get either that you get a single chromatid, and that can take the form of either an additional chromatid, loss of a chromatid, or here, two single chromatids in the oocyte. So if you've got single chromatids here, they, they, they can't align properly, or they struggle to align on, on the second meiotic spindle, and the chance of error is very much increased. So looking at these defects, a natural question, knowing what we know now about the regulation of meiosis, is whether cohesin and its protector are compromised during fe female aging. So to um, address this question, we went, we went to the mouse, because it wasn't so easy to do this work, do this work in the human. Um, and this is, so, so the mouse strain we were using had a lifespan of about 25 months. And if we just do a, sing, singular, uh, a simple linear extrapolation to female age here, we estimate that a 12-month-old mouse is about equivalent to a 40-year-old woman. I mean, I'm sure it's not as simple as that, but just to give an idea. And when we started on this work, people were saying, well, well mice don't exhibit an age effect. But we found that if you let them get old enough, they do. And it's very similar to the type of defect we see in older women. So here is a normal, uh, this is the uh, mouse meiosis 1 bivalent chromosome. After, uh, this is meiosis 2, the dyad chromosome. Um, and here's the young mouse. They're all dyads. And in the older mouse, we see single, single uh, chromatids beginning to emerge. And we see that at 15 months, we see that in 40% of all sites. So we wanted to look at what, was, what, was, what were the events leading to that. So we took these GV stage eggs from the mouse, we cultured them in vitro, they spontaneously resume meiosis, and then we do chromosome spreads halfway through M phase here. And you see in these older ones, you've got these loosely attached bivalent chromosomes. Uh, um, and, and also we found that the centromeres were, were coming apart. So here's, uh, from a young mouse, you get these, uh, at the resolution we were working with then, we could see just a single fo focus, and as the mice got older, they were separated and sometimes quite, quite, quite um, 
distantly separated. So during aging, we're getting this change to the bivalent structure, we're getting uh, um, this more open structure with distantly uh, separated uh, centromeres, which of course is going to be much more difficult to handle this, to, this type of structure to align on the meiosis one spindle. So um, it looked like cohesion was reduced, and indeed when we measured it, it was. This is, co this is rec these oocyte chromosomes staining for Rec8 cohesion. That's during meiosis one, and this is the crest signal here, staining the, the, the kinetochore proteins. Um, and you see here in the, in the two-month-old mouse that, there is, that there is, the cohesion is nicely uh, positioned between the sister chromatids holding them together, whereas in the 15-month-old mouse, there's very little cohesion there at all, and it's generally just scattered on the chromatin. And so we quantified this by looking at what, what's, the, what's the overlap between the crest and the, and the rec 8, and it's significantly reduced by 15 months. And we found that that was accompanied by reduction in Chagoshin. So I said Chagoshin is the one who protects the, 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 the cohesion between the centromere. And when we stay in cohesion in, uh, for Chagoshin in the younger and older mouse, again, it's markedly reduced. Here in the younger mouse, you see the Chagoshin bringing, and it's there positioned, ready to bring the phosphatase to the Rec8 to protect it between centromeres. As they get older, it's reduced and it's also mislocalized. So to summarize so far, what we see during aging is we see depletion of cohesion and that, that's accompanied by reduced recruitment of its protector, which in a sense creates the perfect storm and really makes a quite robust way to, 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 to sabotage fertility in older, in older females. Now an attractive thing about this, of course, is that it can explain what we see in those sites of older women. We can... Uh, and, and also, if we go back to our risk of trisomy 21 in younger women, it also can, can, can give explanations there, because if you've got a single subtelomeric uh, crossover now, you only need to lose cohesion distal to that crossover for the bivalent to come apart. So if you've got your cohesion, uh, your crossover positioned here, you, might only, you need only to lose a few cohesion rings for this structure to come apart, so explaining why it may, might become vulnerable even in younger women. So given that cohesion loss was a reasonable molecular sort of candidate to underlie the association between female age and aneuploidy, we were interested to investigate more, and a key question for us is when does it happen? Does it happen during this prolonged arrest in this, in, in the, when oocytes are in their non-growing stages where they remain in the ovary for decades? Or might it happen during oocyte growth? And you might imagine that as, women get, that, that as females get older and during this um, intensive period of metabolic activity required for this oocyte to grow to full size, that you might get more generation of reactive oxygen species, for example, that might damage the cohesion ring. Um, and it was, so, so we wanted to distinguish between these two, and it's important for clinical reasons as well, because even at menopause, there, women, women have, it's estimated, about 1,000 primordial stage oocytes left in their ovaries. And if there's a possibility to kickstart those, then we might be able to restore fertility. However, if they have been affected by cohesion loss, then they're going to suffer the effects of age. So in order to look at this, we went back to the ovary and started to try and attune our eye to find these primordial follicles, which usually reside here in the cortex of the, of the ovary. Uh, and this, this is an image of one here with a large nucleus surrounded by a small number of granulosa cells. So when we stained for Rec8, and for this we used a Rec8 mic mouse because we were worried about background, background fluorescence in the, in the, in the, in the ovary. And you can see here in the two month, uh, and we use 12 month old mice as well because by the time they get to 15 months, there are very few primordials left. So here's the rec staining in the two months and the rec staining in the 12 month, and you can see it's significantly reduced. And to see whether that was, whether this loss in cohesion occurs acutely during old age or whether it occurs gradually, we compared cohesion levels in the primordial stage 
between two, six, and 12 months old. And I think you can see from this that this cohesion loss does indeed occur gradually throughout life. And interestingly, when, so what the data I showed you so far was based on ovarian sections that had been permeabilized. So we were just seeing the cohesion that was associated with the DNA. All soluble cohesion had been washed away. But when we looked at, uh, at ovarian sections that hadn't been permeabilized, we saw only a very modest, non-significant reduction in, 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 in cohesion levels. So the point is, that there's plenty of cohesion swimming around in the nucleus there. It just doesn't want to be, remain associated with the chromosomes. So another question we ask now is whether this cohesion depletion might be, because, might be linked to the decline in the population of primordial follicles. So this ovarian section here shows you the primordial follicles at birth. So this, the ovary is really jam-packed full of them. Here's postmenopausal, and you've got to travel miles before you find a neighbor. So it was a question of, is, are these oocytes losing their cohesion because they just have nobody to talk to? So in order to address that then, we used a mouse model um, uh, in which we can induce uh, accelerated ovarian, uh, ovarian aging. So if you knock out P10, and we've known this for, for quite some time, if you knock out P10, you get uncontrolled recruitment of, of of primordial stage follicles. So we did this using a LOXP Cree system driven by tamoxifen. And these lines here are the controls. So we see between two and 14 weeks, the population of primordial follicles is going down gradually. But in the P10 knockout, by 14 weeks, we've hardly anything. And you can see up here in this ovarian section, there are very, there are, um, the ovary is more or less empty. So, the question of then whether cohesion loss is, 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 is occurring in these P10 knockout mouse. So we did, we let the eggs mature, we, we spread them at meiosis one, and you can hear, see here this nice rec eight staining between the chromosomes, and we see no difference between the, the wild type and the P10 knockout. So to summarize this, Cohesion is lost gradually from oocyte chromosomes. It's associated with reduced recruitment of its protector, and it occurs during prolonged arrest at the primordial stage, and it occurs in parallel with ovarian aging, but does not appear to be mechanistically linked to it. Now, of course, the next uh, question will be whether cohesion loss also occurs in human oocytes, and that's something we're doing at the moment. This is a human uh, meiosis one chromosome spread here, stained for uh, uh, centromere proteins, uh, or for kinetochore proteins, and for Rec8. So this work is ongoing, and for that we're using oocytes donated by women with no known history of infertility. So it's oocytes donated specifically for research, but we don't have the data ready to talk about yet. So I apologise for that. So. Our way of thinking now is that female reproductive aging is really driven by two clocks. It's driven by the decline in the number of oocytes in the ovary, and also, and we call this ovarian aging, and then by the redu reduction in cohesion proteins, which causes the chromosomes to come apart, and so we call this chromosomal aging. And indeed, so the, the possibility of developing intervention strategies to combat this, we think might, might be limited. I mean, it's happening gradually throughout life. It's happening in these primordial stage oocytes. So the possibility to prevent cohesion loss, and we don't know the mechanisms of it yet, but the possibility to prevent it might be limited. Perhaps our, 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 our strategies might be confined, confined to reducing its consequences. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention and to acknowledge the people in my lab who did this work, our collaborators and our funders. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for, for this uh, really interesting talk. Um, before we get some questions from the audience, I'd like to ask, there are several proteins involved there. Uh, do you know of any human mutations in these proteins that are prone to aneuploidy. So one can imagine mm. if, if you have a mutation in one of these, uh, a loss of function mutation, that would have a similar effect on... Um, mm. 
on the rate of aneuploidy. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know that any cohesin uh, mutations have been associated with, inf with fertility or aneuploidy in the human population yet, but I think it'd be interesting to keep an eye on it. I think the, in, in mouse, so, so a problem with cohesin mutations, so if, if it's, because cohesin has so many functions, it's involved in recombination as well. If you don't have REC8, you don't get repair between homologs, you get repair between sisters, that meiotic recombination. So if you've got a catastrophic mutation in that, you're, not, you're going to have not aneuploidy, but no oocytes. Yeah? So it would need to be something quite subtle, and it's, I think it's something that could be looked at in these sort of 100,000 genomes project in the UK and so on. It would be interesting, indeed. Any more questions? Uh, I have one. I have an obstetrical question. Um, as you, you both demonstrated with the previous speaker, there is uh, cohesin depletion and dislocated kinetochore in all chromosomes. So why do we see more trisomy 21? Is it only because it is viable or is it because there is something special on this chromosome? It's cause, I want to show you this actually. I somehow removed that this morning. <laughs> so. This is, um, I compiled this from data, large, uh, two large data sets from Dagan Wells and Alan Handyside's lab. And it shows you the aneuploidy by chromosome. And you'll see there that all of the chromosomes missegregate from time to time. The highest incidence are 15, 16, 19, 20, 21, 22. Now of those only, we, we really know, you know, 15 is, 16 is, has a uh, most common cause of miscarriage, and 21 is viable. We don't see the others. So I think we're seeing aneuploidies in all chromosomes, but most of them not compatible with life. Okay, thank you very much.